Hi, everybody. In today's um, lecture, I'd like to talk about uh, the equation for the potential energy stored in the electric field. And so I've called this field store energy. So this goes back to our 1000 level physics class. We're all familiar with the idea that point masses and point charge um, in gravitational and electric fields feel a force. So for example, in a gravitational field, the force that an object might feel, say here on planet Earth, would be F equals to mg, right? So a little point mass, which we'll call m, right? Inside of a gravitational field g here on Earth, that's 9.8 meters per second squared pointing downwards, right? The force is F equals mg. And in an electric field, the force that a point charge Q feels in an electric field E is F equals QE. Now, point masses can only feel a force in the direction that the field points because there's no negative masses, right? But point charges can have either positive or negative charge. And so they can either be accelerated parallel to or anti-parallel to the field. So positive charges go down electric field lines and negative charges go upstream, okay? So we can agree here that the point mass or point charge will accelerate according to the force that it's under. And that will change the kinetic energy of the particle, ignoring all other forces. What that means is that the kinetic energy changing for these conservative forces implies that the potential energy must also change. For example, for a point mass, in a gravitational field, the potential energy here on Earth is U is equal to mgh, where h is your height with respect to the coordinate system. For example, the distance off of the floor, for example. So if you put an object up high, it has a high potential energy, and then you let it go, it falls downward, the potential energy drops, but it's accelerating, so its kinetic energy goes up, okay? The same can be said for point charges in an electric field. If you have a positive point charge, and you have an electric field and you release it, it's going to accelerate from rest in the direction of the electric field gaining kinetic energy. But since it's a conservative force, that must mean that it loses potential energy, right? Just like the analogy of the mass in the field. So what we can conclude is that there is potential energy that is changing for these scenarios. Now, where does that potential energy come from? energy has to be stored in some way. Potential energy is stored energy, right? So what stores the energy is the field itself. So if the field vanished, for example, the point charge, point mass, if there were no electric field or no gravitational field, they wouldn't feel a force anymore. Their kinetic energy wouldn't change. So there's no change in potential energy. It's zero or constant, right? So that must mean that it's the field itself that stores that potential energy, okay? So how much potential energy, for example, can an electric field store? Well, the expression for that is that the potential energy U, which is stored in an electric field that has a magnitude of E in some volume is given by this equation. The potential energy is equal to epsilon naught over two times the interval of the magnitude of the electric field squared integrated over the volume dv. Remember here that epsilon naught is the permittivity of free space, which is 8.854 times 10 to the minus 12 in SI units, okay? So as a way of showing you that this expression is true, what I'd like to do is work problem 29 from Purcell and Moore and work this example problem for you. So let's go over this and read it together. We have a parallel plate capacitor and it has two plates that are separated by a distance D. So there's a distance D in between the plates. And these plates are parallel to one another and oppositely charged. So one of them has a positive surface charge density plus sigma, and the other has a negative surface charge density minus sigma. Now the problem says, if you wanna pull the plates apart by a small distance X, how much work does that require? Show that this amount of work gives the same magnitudes as the potential energy expression stored in the field. U is equal to epsilon naught over two times the integral of E squared dV, okay? All right, so um, at this point, I'd like to go ahead and work this out. Um, I'm gonna switch here, stop my share there, and start my share on my iPad.
I'll call it storage. Okay, so we know the equation for work. The equation for work is just the force dotted with the displacement. In this case, I'm gonna set it up so that I'm actually moving in the X direction. And the reason for that is I've got my parallel plates here. Doesn't really matter how I orient them, does it? Okay, so here's my plates. This is gonna be my X axis, okay? And what I'm going to do is I'm going to displace these plates. I want to pull the plates apart. So I'm going to fix this one here. I'm going to fix it at my origin. And then the other plate, I'm going to give a little tug to the right with some displacement built back, for example, like that. Okay. Now, what's my force? Well, let's back up a little bit. In a previous lecture for Gauss's Law, we showed that for a single plate, right, with surface charge density sigma everywhere, if you had um, an infinite size plate, we're going to assume here that they're very large, so that this um, approximation of an infinite plate works out okay. Then you have some electric field lines that stick out perpendicular to the surface of your plate on either side for the positively charged. Of course, it would be pointing inwards for the negatively charged plate, okay. So here, the electric field, um, from one plate, we found the magnitude of that, and it was sigma over two epsilon naught. Okay, so if you need a refresher of where that comes from, I have a lecture posted um, on that, and you should look back at that. For now, just accept that the electric field from an infinite plate or sheet of charge is sigma over two epsilon naught, where sigma is the surface charge density. Okay, now we have here that this is our electric field. And we've already reviewed the fact that the magnitude of the force that a charge Q experiences is equal to F is equal to QE. So this is the magnitude of our force equals the magnitude of the charge Q times the electric field. Okay, well, what we're gonna do is we're gonna talk about the force that the plate on the left, which I can call my positively charged plate, right, exerts on my plate on the right, which is my negatively charged plate. So the field that my negatively charged plate feels or experiences is going to be sigma over two epsilon naught from the plate on the left, okay? Now, what's the charge, the magnitude of the charge of my plate on the right, okay? Well, this is a surface charge density sigma, right? And a surface charge density is the charge Q divided by the area A, okay? So if I want to solve for Q, then Q is equal to sigma times A. Okay, so now plugging into my equation F equals QE, then my equation for the magnitude of my force, this is just the magnitude by the way, I'm taking absolute values everywhere. That should be sigma A times the electric field, which is sigma over two epsilon naught. And then that evaluates to this expression, sigma squared A over two epsilon naught. So that's the force. So that's the force that this object is um, going to feel. Okay. Now that means that um, the work that has to be put in to give this a tug, okay, is going to be equal to the force dotted with the displacement. Okay. So the total amount of work that you're going to have to plug in, if the displacement is in the x direction and the force is also in the x direction, then um, what happens is I'm going to have to tug on the plate to the right by this amount get it to pull apart, okay? So here I've got the work is equal to the force, which is the integral of here, work is equal to the integral of uh, sigma squared A over two epsilon naught, because I'm gonna have to apply at least that much force to get the plate to move, right? The negative plate is gonna feel an attractive force to the left from the uh, positively charged plate. It's gonna be to the left. So if I want to pull to the right, I have to pull to the right with that same amount of force in order to get it to displace, right? So I'm going to pull to the right. The positive plate's going to be pulling to the left, but they're equal and opposite. And so the thing moves at a constant speed, okay? All right, so here I have sigma squared A over two epsilon naught. The plus X direction, which is which I want to pull it, is parallel to my force, which I'm pulling to the right, it's displaced to the right. 
So the dot product, the cosine theta term there goes cosine zero goes to one, okay? And then I can just write dx. Now I wanna integrate this over the amount that I want it displaced. So that's gonna be from its initial position, right? So x1 to its final position, x2, okay? So then this would be sigma squared a over two epsilon naught, those are all constants. And then they pull out of this little dx integral, which goes from x1 to x2. So this is sigma squared a over two epsilon naught times x2 minus x1, or sigma squared a over two epsilon naught delta x. So however much I'm displacing it, right? That's what I've got. Okay, so this is my equation therefore for the work. Now, I'm gonna use this formula and I'm gonna show that it's the same as integrating for the potential energy stored in that field. That I get the same magnitude result. So remember that our expression is u is equal to epsilon naught over two times the integral of e squared dv. Okay, so that's my expression. Now, what volume is enclosed by this field? This sort of sets up, you know, how much I've got here. Okay, so here's my coordinate system. Here's my plate sitting at the origin, my positive plate, okay? And here's my negative plate. And I'm gonna pull it to the right, and so it's gonna displace over. So the field is in between these two plates, right? Now the deal here is that now I have to consider Let's do a side view. So here's my positive plate and here's my negative plate. My positive plate, I'm gonna draw those electric field lines in blue or in red, and it's pointing outward away from the positive charge on either side, okay? Now my negative charged plate, right? It also points outwardly from the plate, but in this case, the electric field lines must point towards the negative charge. And so here, is that. Okay. So my total electric field lines, I'll draw those in purple. Whoops, supposed to be in purple. My total electric field lines then in between are going to be the sum of those two fields. So I've got some total electric field in purple, right? And the total electric field, E total, will point in the same direction sigma over two epsilon naught, but then I have that from the red and from the blue, and they point in the same direction, so I then multiply that times two. So my total electric field is sigma over epsilon naught in between the two plates of the parallel plate capacitor. Okay, I hope that makes sense. Because remember that electric field of a superposition. So you're going to have in between the two plates, the electric field being sigma over two epsilon naught pointing to the right from your positively charged plate, and then sigma over two epsilon naught pointing to the right from your negatively charged plate in between the two plates. Now, it's the field in between the two plates that we need to worry about for how it affects the motion of the positively charged plate. It's the volume of the field in between those two plates. That's my dB, okay? So what's that volume gonna look like? Here I have u is equal to epsilon naught over two, and now it's a, a volume integral. But what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna set it up so that it's over the area of the plates, right? So that I'll have a dA, and then I'll have my dx displacement, which is the width in between the plates. Remember that the volume of any you know, upright solid that doesn't go in or go out um, is gonna be the area of the base times the height. So that's kind of the idea that I've got here. So here my electric field is sigma over epsilon naught, that's squared, that plugs in for my e squared. And then my dv is going to be dA dx. Okay. So the area, I'm just going to integrate over the um, area of my plate from 0 to a. And then my dx, I'm integrating from x1 to x2, just like before. Okay. So when I perform that integral, my um, sigma over epsilon naught squared is a constant. And so it pulls out, right? So here I have sigma squared 
And then I've got an S1 knot on the top, right? And that is uh, canceled out by one of the epsilon knots on the bottom. So I end up with sigma squared over two epsilon naught, right? And then I'm doing the integral like so. So I have the integral of dx from x1 to x2 and the integral over the area of my plate from zero to a. So the integral of dA is just my, my area. And then I evaluate that from zero to a, so that gives me a. And then the integral of dx is just x. And then I integrate that from x1 to x2 and I get yet again delta x. So this gives me sigma squared over two epsilon naught times a times delta x. Now that's exactly the same result that I had from my other expression for the work, okay? My other expression for the work gave me sigma squared a delta x over two epsilon naught. So that's exactly what I had before, okay? So you can show that this expression for the energy storage works for either way, okay? All right. So what have we learned? Well, we've learned that this expression for the potential energy stored in the electric field works out, right? The amount of potential energy stored in an electric field could be found by epsilon naught over two times the integral of e squared dv, okay? And we showed that this expression works by showing you the equation for the work for the specific case of the parallel plate capacitor. But this is a generally true expression. It also leads to a discussion of what we often call the energy density, okay? So electric fields store energy. We often talk though about the amount of energy stored per unit volume, which we call the energy density, okay? So the energy density shown here as a little u sub e, okay, that's the energy density or the energy per unit volume stored in the electric field is epsilon naught times e squared over two. Okay, and this expression gets used a lot too when you're talking about um, variable uh, electromagnetic field stored in light and so on and so forth. Okay, so this is a generally true expression that you can lean on from here on out. All right, thank you for your attention. Um, let me know if you have any questions and I'll see you in class.